Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first Garden Hour. Uh, this show is the beginning of hopefully a season-long opportunity for everyone to be asking their garden questions, and hopefully we'll be able to answer them. Uh, for some of you that remember the garden line, uh, we're going to be kind of playing off that for the next hour, and then every hour on Tuesday night for the rest of the growing season. To start out with, my name is John Ball. I'm the Extension Forestry Specialist at South Dakota State University, and I'm also the Forest Health Specialist for the South Dakota Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Essentially, I'm the tree guy. So tonight I'll be here to talk to you a little bit about some of our current tree and shrub problems, and then hopefully answer your questions that you might have on that subject. But fortunately, I'm joined by a number of other panelists, in fact, another garden line veteran, and I'm gonna introduce her next and she can discuss what she's talking about tonight as well as a little introduction. So Rhoda, I'm turning it over to you. All right, thank you, John. I'm Rhoda Burrows, Horticulture Extension Specialist. Uh, I cover mostly fruit and vegetables across the state, but I've also worked with master gardeners. I've been here over 20 years now in South Dakota, so I've probably met many of you, or you have at least seen me. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking about, I'm going to talk a little bit about pruning grapes and raspberries tonight. And next, I believe, we have to Christine. Good evening, everyone. I am the new consumer horticulture specialist, and I've been here all of three months. So I'm excited to, to join the state of South Dakota and meet everyone on the line and um, help help consumers with their gardening questions. And tonight I'm going to be talking about master gardeners, and I have an additional exciting announcement. So stay tuned for my segment. And last but not least is Amanda. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Bachman. I am the pesticide education and urban entomology field specialist uh, for SDSU Extension based here in Pierre, South Dakota. I say that like you can see anything identifying about my office. And as the urban entomologist, I will be talking tonight about some of our sort of frequently asked insect questions so far this spring, which are ticks, uh, cicadas, and also grubs. So I will be the final segment. So stick around to hear more about that. And I'll turn it back over to John. All right, thank you, Amanda. And as you can see, we've got kind of a full hour here, but not so full, we can't answer your questions. And that's a real big part of it. As was mentioned early in the intro, we do have a question and answer segment. And what we're gonna ask you to do is if you have questions on that relate to anything we're discussing tonight or anything about your vegetables, trees, shrubs, any bug you see in the yard, master gardening or such, please type it into the question and answer uh, section there. And we'll try to answer it during our segment. And we save a little time at the end to actually come back and go through some of the questions as well. So we hope to answer your question here this evening. We'll try to group questions together uh, in that. But you, the uh, listening audience here, is really a real important part of Garden Hour. And it's really going to be question driven. But we're always going to start with a few slides and a little bit of some topic that we'd like to discuss. So I'm going to start on that right now. And we'll start with a couple of pictures that I have here. Well, to begin with, I'm going to always try to introduce where we are in growing degree days. Now, South Dakota is a big state. And obviously, there's a lot of differences in climate across our state. But if you take a look at where we are in the season right now, we're at about 160 growing degree days in Sioux Falls and 100 in Rapid City. That's pretty much where we were last year. Now, some years were a lot further ahead and some years were a little behind. And everybody knows we're not done with snow yet anywhere in the state. Uh, we seem to always have that May blizzard. But right now, uh, the Norway maples are in bloom in Brookings, South Dakota, and also down into Sioux Falls. And what you'll find is that when plants bloom, in other words, it's been warm enough, long enough for them to begin flowering, 
it's usually warm enough, long enough for certain insects and diseases to start developing. So we use phenology, you know, how plants are developing to give us an idea as to when we need to do treatments rather than just base everything strictly on a calendar. I've seen the Norway maples bloom as early as the middle of April and as late as the middle of May. So like I say, we're kind of almost in the middle, maybe a little slower than, than what normal is. But when we have this tree in bloom, we also have to start seeing some pests. So Amanda, my next slide. Ah, look at that, tent caterpillars. If you're out right now walking on a path or something like that, you'll take a look and you'll see this webbing starting to develop on the trees. In some trees, you gotta look very closely. It's gonna look a little bit like cotton candy uh, up in the trees. And if you look really close at it, you'll actually see the very small larvae that are beginning to develop. Now, right now, they're really not causing any problems. They're just babies. But when they get to be kids, they're gonna be a little rambunctious and they're gonna start working their way out on the leaves and munching through them. Now, right now they're fairly easy to control. That webbing that you see is actually a means of protecting them. It helps reduce the environmental problems that we have. It's too hot or too cold. Uh, they like a little shelter at night. And it also keeps everything that wants to eat them from getting to them. So a very simple way of managing these insects right now, why the webs are very small is to push a stick up into it, maybe with a nail partway through it, stick it up there and twist it, kind of like you're making cotton candy, uh, and you'll rip the nest apart. And, and when you do that, everybody that wants to chow down on these little insects will be able to find them and they'll be gone. Uh, now, by the way, I did mention you want to push a stick up in there, twist it and pull it. Do not do the let's use a torch and burn them off the tree. Uh, that would be an example of fire blight that nobody wants to see. So let's avoid that. Uh, for all our West River viewers, the engraver beetles, the cousins to the mountain pine beetle, uh, started flying this weekend about the time we would expect them. So right now we're telling people, don't be thinning your pine trees, cutting out in the forest and such because the odor of those uh, freshly cut trees is actually gonna attract these insects. And I might mention, because we're in a drought right now, standing live trees are susceptible uh, to this insect. And we also have diseases. And one of the diseases we're seeing right now is Diplodia tip blight. It's a fungus disease that affects ponderosa pines uh, throughout the state. In fact, it's becoming a real problem in the Black Hills, uh, as well as we'll see at East River. And I might mention too that uh, what it goes over all these insect and disease problems is our drought. And every tree and shrub out there is gonna need a little drink of water. But we have some other things going on. So Amanda, my next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about tree planting because now's the time that you can get out there and get trees in and bare root is a great way to go. And this is what we planted on Arbor Day last week in uh, Brookings here for South Dakota State University. Bare root's a very good way to get a tree or a shrub. Uh, you're not buying soil, you're not buying packaging, but the critical thing is getting them in at the right depth and the hole needs to be wider, of course, but it shouldn't be that deep because that crook want and needs to be above ground. In my next slide here, um, you can see that dig the hole wider, never twist the roots in, and that little crook you see in the center that I have that white ring around, that crook is where the tree was grafted. That should always be above ground. If I can't see the crook, and one of our planting crews did try to plant one too deep, you planted it way too deep. The highest root should be just below the soil surface. Now, a lot of people aren't gonna do bare root. They're gonna go to the garden center and buy containers. And that's another great way. So I've got a couple slides on that too. And Amanda, my next slide looks at container plants. Try to dig the hole about two to three times wider than the size of the container ball. And the only soil going back into that hole is the soil you took out. And you might say, well, why did I do that at all then? Uh, the reason was to loosen up the soil. You don't wanna change the texture. You don't wanna add peat. 
You don't want to add sand to it or anything of that same soil you took out goes back in, but you've loosened it. And that's going to be really important to get that tree started. And you also want the highest root right below the soil surface. Now they come too deep in the pot to begin with. So my next slide here shows that you've got to take your hands and pull away that soil at the top until you find that crook. And that might be a third the way down in the container. And then the other thing you're gonna deal with containers is circling roots. And if we don't start breaking up those circling roots, they can actually become girdling roots and end up strangling the tree at some point in the future, five or sometimes 10 years away. But the best way to start removing those circling roots is to do what I'm gonna show you in the next slide, which is just dig all the way around the edge of the container. When you've got the tree ready to go and you're cutting off all those circling roots, you say, oh my goodness, I've taken off most of the root system. You've taken off the bad part of the root system. Uh, the rest of the roots will recover very quickly. So just shovel all the way around, just that far in, uh, pull away those circling roots and you're done. And no matter how you plant the tree, my next slide is gonna show the most important thing to do and that's water this year. Uh, about a gallon of water for every inch caliper and, and inch caliper is measured at six inches above the ground. So if it's one inch, six inches above the ground, uh, you need to give a gallon of water. If it's two inches, two gallons of water each watering. And ideally, for the first two weeks after you plant a tree, if it hasn't rained, water it daily. Uh, that's a real critical thing. And for everyone here looking to get shelter belts in, this year, absolutely, every seedling, the second it's planted, it gets a pint of water. And if you could get a pint of water every two or three days for the rest of the summer, that would be a big help. Essential to water for the first couple of weeks to get them started. I mean, we're all hoping for May rains and June rains, but we are in a drought in almost all of the state and in the Northwestern part of the state in a severe drought. And so this year we do have to pay attention to watering. It's gonna be essential for trees. Well, what are you gonna plant? And so for my next slide, just as a reminder, uh, you're not planting ash because of emerald ash borer. And we also have way too many maples and I'm fearful some pest is gonna come from somewhere and start taking out our maples. So my best bit of advice for planting this spring is look what your neighbors have planted and plant something else. We need to get diversity. And a tree that a lot of people don't think about, particularly as a flowering tree is Kentucky coffee tree. That's the flowers to it. And the flowers can be fragrant as well. So, I mean, it's not a huge bloom, but I'll bet you never really looked at the flowers on these trees and they are quite attractive. In the next slide, is a Kentucky coffee tree in our campus. Now that's about 20 years old uh, right now. So no, they're not the fastest growing trees, but they do pick up speed as they, as they get older. Uh, the first couple of years, they kind of sit there, kind of figure out where they are. And then they start to grow and it's a wonderful tree for much of the state. Uh, I've seen them everywhere, Phillip, Murdo, Aberdeen. Um, so I think they're adaptable a lot of area of state as long as you water them, but think of diversity. And the reason we're thinking of diversity because of my next slide, and that's emerald ash borer. Now emerald ash borer has only been confirmed in two counties, Minnehaha County and Lincoln County. Essentially we have it uh, in Canton, Worthing and Sioux Falls, though I'm certain that it's in some of the other communities and we just haven't found it there yet. We never find the first one. So in those counties, people do need to start treating their trees, their ash trees, if they want to protect them from the emerald ash borer. We did a uh, injection workshop this last week in Sioux Falls. There's a number of different methods that can be used out there, but they all have to be used by commercial applicators. Uh, if you have a tree so large, you can't get your hands around it like this, bigger than this you really do need to hire someone to treat that tree because they'll have the chemicals available to actually do that treatment. So the small trees, yeah, you can treat yourself, but the large ones, you'll have to pay someone to do it. And they'll have to treat them about every other year for at least the next 10 years. And after that, it'll kind of dribble out beyond that. But now's the time to start treating your trees if you have not done so already. And spring, 
right after the trees leaf out is the best time to treat. And my next slide will show you why. That's the adult emerald ash borer. And the adult emerald ash borer has to feed on leaves for about two weeks before they lay eggs. If you inject a tree just after it leaves out, that chemical's taken up. And when the adults emerge and munch on a few leaves, they die before they even lay eggs. So that's a great way to kill them. Next slide. We'll show that, well, if you didn't get it quite in time, you'll be able to kill the larvae while they're very small too. So why you can actually inject a tree throughout the growing season, the sweet spot, the time to treat that we actually get the most bang for our buck is actually treating from leaf out till the end of June because the chemical there will kill the adults as they're feeding before they lay eggs. And if one happens to land on your tree that didn't feed on it first, when the egg hatch, it's gonna be a very tiny larvae and they are easily killed. So that's my little intro for tonight on what's going on out there. And we'll probably have some more items later on, but um, Rhoda, do we have any questions for me to answer right now? We do. Um, one person asked, can you root wash a container tree to visualize the root system and the, in essence, make it a bare root tree? Absolutely, yes. In fact, that's the best way to plant a container tree or shrub is to wash as much of that soil off as you can because that's going to loosen up the root system and plant it. After all, you don't need that soil when you're planting it and the better connection, the better knit you can get with the surrounding soil, the better. So I highly recommend trying to wash as much of that off as you can. Excellent question. Do we have a couple of more? Yes, we do. Uh, when is the best time to prune bushes like burning bush, dogwood, red twig, et cetera, and how much should you prune at a time? Well, we're kind of getting at the very end of that season. Uh, so once the plants start leafing out, we're kind of done. And I know some areas we haven't had the dogwoods breaking bud yet. If they haven't broke bud yet, prune them off at about two inches above the ground and remove about a third of the canes. So a third of the canes, but you're gonna cut them off at two inches above the ground. Now, burning bush is a whole nother beast. You don't prune that close to the ground. Instead, you just thin out some of the branches. Heavy pruning on burning bush is most likely to kill it. And sometimes the deer will do that for you. <laughs> and, and, and that would be the West River answer. <laughs> because, uh, and, and if someone's watching this and says, you know what, I wish I had more deer in my yard and I live in Rapid City, <laughs> plant burning bush. They're, they're kind of candy for them and bunnies. Um, I think I have about a minute or two. Is there any additional questions? I don't know if you want to answer this one. Can you recommend perennials to plant near a black walnut tree? You, you know, I'll, that'll be a good handoff question because I'll <laughs> start it, Rhoda, and you can pick it up. And uh, the reason I said I'll start it is people are familiar with the problem of black walnuts, that they produce a uh, chemical called juglones, which can actually interfere with the growth of other plants. Pines and spruce are the big examples. They actually will stunt nearby pines and spruce. The other thing is any member of the Solanaceae family, so tomatoes, potatoes, and that, they'll stunt the growth too. But interesting enough, some plants actually do a little bit better beneath them, hostas, for example. So there are perennials that will tolerate black, uh, black walnuts or even thrive under those conditions. But the big ones to avoid would be pines and spruce, small ones, as they get bigger, they can hold their own. And then tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, if you happen to have a walnut near those, uh, quite often they're affected. And I'll finish with this, how close is too close? Roots of a tree go out about as far as a tree is tall. So I wouldn't wanna have my vegetable garden within one tree height of a black walnut, uh, you may be asking for trouble. So uh, if there's other questions, I'll pick those up towards the end, but you know, that's a perfect segue into your segment on herbaceous plants. So Rhoda, I'll turn it over to you. And I'm going to, Amanda, if you can bring up the slides. And I'm going to go into uh, raspberries, which I believe are also not terribly tolerant of 
of uh, black walnut. I, I wanted to bring this up because now is a great time to make sure if you have not already uh, pruned and thinned out your raspberry patch. Uh, this is an example of about the spacing you want. You, you'd like to have at least a hands width between canes, three or four canes per square foot. And remember, as the season progresses, the patch is going to be sending up new shoots that will be the canes for next year. So this can get pretty crowded in here in a hurry. The more open it is, the more light penetrates. You'll have a little bit less problem with uh, spotted wing drosophila, which is a fruit fly that's become a problem for us. So uh, healthy plants need lots of light and lots of room. Next slide, please. Uh, this is also the time when we prune grapevines, and uh, they're one of the last plants to leaf out, uh, probably along with oaks. So we have a little bit more time in the spring to get to those. Uh, sometimes people get worried when they are pruning their grapevine and it starts bleeding, and it can throw out a lot of water, uh, and, and people get concerned. Don't, don't worry about it. It's perfectly fine uh, to have that bleeding. It helps reestablish the water column within the, within the plant. So that's perfectly fine. The later that you prune it, uh, you can actually delay a bud break a little bit um, by leaving it until the last minute. So uh, this is one way to prune a grapevine. We have a center trunk, which will be uh, will be at least three years old, maybe four or five, six, even 10 or 20. Um, and then this is, this is a, a way that we train our master gardeners to do it because it's fairly simple. You take four canes and you can see them going out horizontally, just four canes. What are canes? They're the shoots that grew last year. So they were green, towards the end of the summer, they turned brown. Those are the one-year-old canes. Grapes produce fruit only on buds that come, that grow from those one-year-old canes. Older wood does not produce fruit. So we put our attention on last year's shoots. We spread them out so they have lots of room. And then each one of those buds on the cane will produce a shoot with up to three clusters of fruit on it. Now, if it's got three clusters, most of the time we'll take off the third because it's smaller and may not have as good quality fruit. But you'll see that that it fills in pretty quick during the during the summer. So that will be a solid sheet of green by midsummer. Uh, you also have you see those short little shoots at the top and and in, in the crook there. Those we leave just one or two canes that have one or two buds on. The shoots that grow out from those are what you're going to use for next year, 2022, when you prune and need uh, to replace the shoots that you put out this year. Next slide, please. This is a different way of pruning that's often used commercially. And, uh, in this case, instead of just four canes, we're actually producing multiple year arms. They're called cordons. So that's older wood that we stretch out along the top wire here. And then from each of those, we select canes that are spaced out. And each of those canes will have three or four buds on them. And each of those buds, again, will produce a shoot with fruit. So you end up with a solid, uh, again, a solid curtain of green uh, with fruit hanging down from it. And then again, we leave short little one or two uh, length, uh, bud length uh, spurs we call them, that will be the re renewal for next year's that will form those canes for next year's. So the principles for printing grapes, the, the nice thing about grapes is they're vines. They're not going to get upset when you print them. You decide that you didn't like the way you did it last year, you can completely redo it. I know a grape grower who's probably used 
at least four different training methods over time. He decides he likes it one way and then then that's not working out quite right. So he goes another. So it's not like trees where you prune it and, and boy, you're committed for the rest of the, that, the life of that tree. Uh, with grapes, if all else fails, you can even come off at the ground and let them come up again. So don't be afraid to prune your grapes. And remember, you need to remove about 80% of last year's growth each year to encourage that new growth because you're fruiting on the one-year-old wood. Next slide. I've been seeing a lot of questions on Facebook and some other, other places about uh, when can I plant? Um, if you've moved into a new area, perhaps, or if it's your first time gardening. Um, so I put out a list of, of plants that can be planted now and some that you want to wait a bit longer. So planting now is along the left hand column there, any of the cool season crops. So uh, pansies and other annual flowers, uh, the salad greens, spinach is probably the most cold hardy of all of them. Um, it will germinate at under 40 degrees, which is fairly unusual for plants. And, uh, and it will grow at fairly low temperatures as well. In fact, it can overwinter in South Dakota if it's got a little bit of protection. Uh, lettuce is a little bit more frost sensitive, so uh, we're probably okay planting it now, but we probably didn't want to plant it three weeks ago. Uh, peas, again, uh, can germinate at cooler temperatures, and we want to plant them now because they'll be maturing as it gets hot and peas do not like heat. So it's kind of a, a race to get them in to grow in that cooler temperatures. Potatoes and asparagus, of course, are being planted underground. So by the time the shoots come up above ground on those, it should be warm enough that they won't get frosted. Otherwise, they will get frosted if it's too cold. And if you've got multiple eyes on the potatoes, uh, it's okay, another one will come up. If you just did single eyes, then you're kind of sunk if it gets frosted. Uh, and then the beets, carrots, onions, and mint all have a fair amount of resistance to frost. What we want to hold off on are all the warm season crops. The solanaceae that John mentioned, tomatoes, peppers, um, okra, the cucurbits, the squashes, the cucumbers, all of those would like to have it at least 50 degrees and would do better at 60 degrees soil temperature to germinate. Uh, watermelons, especially the seedless watermelon, shouldn't be planted until the ground's at least 60 and preferably 65 degrees. So fairly warm. Uh, same thing with beans. Uh, basil is extremely tender to frost. In fact, if you have it in 40 to 45 degrees over a couple of days, it will turn black. So it's definitely a warm season crop. And most annual flowers, the most common ones, tend to be warm season. So things like zinnias and petunias and so forth uh, appreciate those warmer temperatures. So uh, for most of the state, we're probably talking another two to three weeks, uh, depending upon just how tender it is and where you are and how, how quickly it's going to warm up this spring. Or an option is to use road covers or wall of waters or any of those devices to help give the plant a little bit more warmth. And then we also want to remember to harden off any transplants that we get that have been growing in a nice sheltered greenhouse, if we put them right outside in the sun and the wind, the plant doesn't have enough coating to resist the UV light and it'll get burned or it may dry out, desiccate. So if you put them out just for an hour or two to start with and then gradually extending that over about a week's time, that gives the plant time to build up that protective coating on its leaves. And I believe that's it. Do we have questions? 
Now, it looks like most of the questions are going to be for uh, Amanda later on. So I think we'll just go ahead and move straight to Christine. All right, Rhoda, first, thank you for the reminder on what we should be planting. I walked through a local greenhouse this weekend and was really excited to buy all of the plants and bring them home, but listen to, to my own advice. And we did have frost on our grass this morning here in Brookings. And thankfully my kale and chard looked fine, but if I would have put anything else out, I would have been really sorry. So yes, great advice, great reminder. Um, and everyone, I'm the new Consumer Horticulture Extension Specialist, and I just want to acknowledge that I am one half of a dynamic duo that gets to work with SDSU Master Gardeners. So I would like to give a huge shout out to Amy Ladonsky, who is our Volunteer Development Field Specialist and works tirelessly um, to, to promote and develop the SDSU Extension Master Gardener Program. And many of the people on the line with me tonight also help support our Master Gardeners. So for anyone who's wondering, what in the world is a Master Gardener? Master Gardeners go through approximately 40 hours of training as Master Gardener interns, where they get to learn about the basics of botany, entomology, integrated pest management, all things related to soils and fertilizers and composting. We spend a lot of time talking about ornamental plants, vegetables and fruits, woody plants and trees, as well as plant pathology and how to diagnose plant problems. So master gardeners are trained in all of those topics. And as interns, they devote 40 hours of um, volunteer efforts towards um, you know, helping their community with gardening projects, doing outreach and education activities. And once you achieve, complete your hours and your training and achieve the title of Master Gardener, um, you, you continue to work in your community and, and give back at 20 hours per year and 10 hours of continuing education. So um, if you have an interest in gardening, we and and want to you know give back to your community as well as um, continue to cultivate your curiosity about all things in the world of horticulture. We would love to have you join us for our upcoming Master Gardener and Home Horticulture course. So this is going to be an eight-week online course, and it will start on Thursday, June third, and it will be every Thursday until Thursday, July twenty-second. And the program will, or the training will take place from at 6.30 Mountain Time, 7.30 Central Time, and last one hour each of those Thursdays. And there will be readings and videos and, you know, some interactive activities throughout the week um, to help further your learning about all of the topics I've already shared. Additionally, um, we will be having an optional one day in-person workshop the week of July 26th, and we will be hosting these workshops in Brookings, Pier, and Rapid City. But you don't have to be a member of that community to come to the training. We know there'd be um, a bit of travel, but we would love to have you um, in the hands-on training as well. And um, this would be a great opportunity for you to join over 14, or join our 14 Master Gardener Clubs. And we have approximately 400 master gardeners across the state. So this is also a great opportunity to meet other gardeners and people who are maybe interested in similar topics like you um, or have a different area of expertise. We have folks that are really interested in seed saving. Um, we have experts in hybridizing irises and people that are, you know, no, can name every tomato cultivar, even though I can't do that. So I'm very grateful for all of our master gardeners and their skill sets. So um, please consider joining us. Um, the sign up is going to be online. We will be sharing the website where you can register for the training and applications and registration are gonna be due by May 17th. Um, other ways that you can continue to follow along with Master Gardener activities would be um, visiting us at extension.sdstate.edu, where we have a dedicated Master Gardener page, as well as our overall garden and yard page, where you can you know, find all of our extension resources and activities. And then also feel free to engage with Master Gardeners on Facebook at SDSU Extension Master Gardeners. 
and I was just, uh, I'm just a short segment tonight, but I'm happy to answer any questions about Master Gardeners, but I'd be remiss if I didn't share the announcement that Tulip Palooza has been declared at McCrory Gardens. So um, please plan to make a trip to Brookings, South Dakota. McCrory Gardens is part of our South Dakota State University family and it's an incredible opportunity to see all of the spring blooms and get some ideas for some new plants to incorporate into your next container planting or landscaping project. So we, we hope to see you at Tulip Palooza. The, the tulips really are gorgeous right now. So we'd love to see you. And um, if there are any questions for me, I'm happy to address them. And if not, and we'll I know we'll have some more time for questions. So I'm going to happily hand the discussion over to Amanda. Okay. I'm the slide master tonight, so I'm juggling multiple windows. Thank you very much, Christine. I wish I was in Brookings to see Tulip Palooza. I only have one volunteer tulip in my yard right now and it's almost done blooming. So you guys out in the Brookings area are very lucky to have such a great resource in your backyard. And a housekeeping note, if you've been following along in the chat, I have been throwing some resources up there as folks have been mentioning them. So if you do want the link for the Master Gardeners, that's there in the chat, as well as some direct links to the vegetable gardening resources. And thank you so much to everybody that's been submitting questions in the Q&A. Those of you that are in attendee view mode, you can also click on the Q&A and see the questions that we've been typing answers to if you're curious what your neighbors and fellow South Dakotans have been asking about. But I'm going to go over a few things about some of the insects and arthropods that we have been getting questions about here at SDSU Extension so far this spring. I'm starting with ticks because they're sort of the ugh, give people the creeps critter and they're also not an insect. Um, for those of you who need the crash course in your intro to entomology, ticks are arachnids so they're in there with the spiders. They have eight legs versus six legs uh, that our insects have and you can see that really nicely here in this picture picture of an American dog tick. So don't worry, we'll get to pictures of uh, <laughs> less perhaps squicky arthropods in a minute. But I did want to showcase sort of the most common uh, tick that we have here in South Dakota. The American dog tick is widespread across the state. It's the one I see all the time here in Pierre, but you can find it pretty much in every corner of the state. It does vector a couple of diseases. So it is important that if you are out and about and starting to see ticks on yourself or on your pets, that you do make sure that you are treating your animals with a tick, prevent, uh, tick preventative. Um, and that also for you, that you're protecting yourself and making sure that you are you know, wearing sort of appropriate clothing and um, making sure to use a repellent that is labeled for ticks. I you know, was out on La Framboy um, on Saturday for a couple hours and I did make sure to spray my feet and my ankles with DEET because uh, La Fram is one of our tick central places here in the pier area. Um, and if people have questions about ticks, um, you are welcome to throw those into the chat. Um, we do have the black-legged tick, which is sort of the rename of the deer tick for those of you who may be um, sort of from the Eastern part of the country. Um, but the black-legged tick um, is really only in sort of the Eastern third of South Dakota. So it is not widespread across the state. And then we also have um, a Rocky Mountain tick that is you know, very much in just sort of the Black Hills area. So we do have some, a couple different species um, and it is important to prevent tick bites and stay vigilant because they can vector some diseases and nobody wants the Lone Star tick because that's the one that can make you allergic to red meat. So wear your repellent. And let's see, what is my next? Next slide is talking about grubs. So we have um, June beetles, which I think from a report from my colleague Adam Fahrenhorst in Brookings uh, said that he was starting to see some in that area. But these are the really, as adults, they're the really large brown beetle um, and they don't fly very well. And that's sort of how people notice them. They're very much attracted to light. And so that's how we see, you know, sort of the adult 
of this critter, but as larvae, they are, you know, some of our white grubs. And you can see this image here is sort of your characteristic white grub. They curl up into like a C shape when they're dug out of the soil. They have a tan or brown head capsule. And then of course their true legs here. The end of their abdomen is a bit darker. Um, and that's because that's where sort of the digested soil and root bits are hanging out before they sort of, you know, poop them out the other end. So if you do handle grubs, uh, you are liable to get pooped on, which is kind of fun. Also, I'm an entomologist and yeah, we, we think some different insect behaviors are a little bit more endearing than the rest of the population. Um, but in lawns, as in pastures, what grubs do is they feed on the roots of grasses mostly, sometimes other plants, but in really high infestations, we'll see these dead patches start to show up. And it can be especially, you know, especially exacerbated by drought conditions. So this is a year where we are sort of ending a large population's life cycle. So the grubs are at their sort of, you know, biggest size. Uh, they're going to pupate, they're going to emerge as adults. So they've been causing a lot of damage over the past couple of seasons. So you may start to notice, um, if you do have any pasture or rangeland, you may start to notice dead spots. If you do notice those, go ahead and scout at the edges of those spots. As the grubs feed, they'll move sort of away from the center and be feeding on sort of the fresh grass roots. So check those edges. You can sometimes peel back the turf like it's a carpet and look for you know, grubs underneath. In a lawn, the same thing applies. If you see dead spots in your lawn, especially if they're very large, that kind of indicates that it's not a disease and that there's something else going on. Pull back that turf at the edges of the dead spot and see what's going on. Um, you usually don't have to, especially now that the soil's warming up, you don't have to dig very far in order to find the grubs. Um, and then identification wise, you know, for a lot of them, it's the size of the grub that is sort of going to determine what, what our treatment options are. But if you do wanna know sort of what species of grub that you have, they have hairs on the end of their abdomen and that's actually the character that we use when we're identifying them. So um, definitely something that you wanna bring us in a nice like fresh sample or take some really good pictures so that we can see um, the pattern of hairs on the end of the abdomen. So that is what I've got on grubs. And then sort of my final sort of fun insect are the cicadas. I am originally from uh, central Pennsylvania. So I've actually lived through a couple of the periodic periodical cicada brood emergences. And I am kind of, I'm super sad that I'm currently not in the DC area um, this spring to encounter this year's brood emergence. Um, so brood 10 is emerging in the, the DC uh, Delmarva area, and it is one of the largest broods of periodical cicadas. They come out every 17 years. And the picture here in the top corner with the red eyes, that's the periodical cicada. So we do have cicadas here in South Dakota, um, but we have, you know, they'll emerge every year. They don't have the red eyes. Um, they're sort of a, a brown or green and black pattern and they come out later in the summer. So if you think about the, the dog days of summer, we've got the dog day cicada that will show up in uh, late July and early August. So the periodical cicadas have been making the news, um, you know, especially if you're reading some national publications, you may have read about the periodical cicadas already and maybe wondered if we have them in South Dakota. And I can tell you that we definitely don't, uh, which is sad because they're really cool. Uh, but they're definitely much more of an east of the Mississippi um, phenomenon and our cicadas aren't going to be showing up until much later in the summer. Um, but yeah, they, you know, emerge from the ground, crawl up in the trees, uh, yell for a couple of weeks, mate, lay eggs, and then die and mass. Um, so it's going to be a boon for the critters on the east coast um, because cicadas are tasty. And that was a thing I forgot to mention with the grubs is one of the things that we notice with grubs too is uh, critters, badgers, skunks, other things will come and dig up yards and pastures looking for those tasty, tasty grubs. So if you're seeing that kind of damage too, that's another indicator that you need to scout for grubs. So that is what I had for sort of our quick insect update uh, as far as questions we've been getting. And I know that 
you know, I'll be back for some insect updates in June. Um, you guys won't see me on garden hour uh, for the rest of May. I've got another commitment. But if you have any questions about insects or anything that you've been seeing in your yard, um, feel free to go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. And I will kind of um, call out one of the questions that I did answer while Christine was talking. It was a great question um, asking about some um, insect control options and you know, asking about a certain um, uh, active ingredient. And one thing that I really advocate with managing any sort of pest in your garden is you wanna make sure that, you're, you, that you've got a proper identification first. Uh, luckily here at SDSU Extension, we've got you know, insect experts, we've got plant experts, we've got plant disease experts, um, because not every kind of damage that you see in a garden is going to be caused by insects. I know insects tend to get a lot of the blame because they're the thing that like we see when we go out in the garden, um, but we've got a lot of arthropods and insects out there that are actually doing good things, good things for us. And, you know, we need to make sure that we're managing problems appropriately so that we don't inadvertently damage them. Especially thinking about pollinators. If you have plants that are blooming in your yard or garden, you want to be really careful with your any insecticide applications because you don't want to impact those pollinators. Um, so yeah, I've got a lengthy answer in the Q&A. Um, about that, but definitely reach out to us uh, via the garden hotline, your local master gardeners, the ask extension widget on the website. Um, and then also you can, you know, save your pictures um, and your questions for uh, garden hour weeks and, you know, email them to us ahead of time and we can maybe, you know, use your question or use your photo in an upcoming week. Um, but I'm not seeing, oh, I suddenly have, is there an organ? Okay, so is there an organic grub treatment? There's not. <laughs> um, the thing with grub treatments is sort of the, the, the products that you would water into your lawn are going to be most effective in July and August when the grubs are at their smallest life stage. So you're going to be targeting management for the newly hatched grubs that are right at the surface. They're small and they'll be um, they'll be sort of manageable at that stage with an insecticide, but there are no um, organic options. Um, and one thing as an entomologist is like, I'm pretty chill about all the insects in my yard. I just let things sort of live their lives um, to try to reach, you know, kind of a balance in what's happening in my yard. Um, but yeah, there's no organic grub treatments. Um, okay, and how and when, yeah, mostly, uh, July to August is when we do our treatments here in South Dakota as far as being um, what we would consider to be preventative. Um, at this point, the grubs are sort of at their largest size and also pupating. Um, so they're not gonna be taking up any product. And so this is not gonna be a great time to treat them, but sort of mid to not quite late, but midsummer is really when we wanna target those grub treatments. Uh, question about what will eat ticks? Uh, possums, possums will eat ticks. Uh, chickens will sometimes eat ticks. <laughs> Anything, you know, any of our larger predatory arthropods that can maybe catch ticks will possibly eat them. Um, but sort of possums are touted as being the mammal that is sort of the best control of, you know, best control for ticks. But really, uh, as far as people and keeping ticks off of you, you really can't beat um, using an appropriately labeled insect repellent. Um, and there's, we're, we're never going to eliminate ticks from a landscape. So really the best thing that you can do is to um, put, the, put the treatment on you. Um, and I've got a pinch hit from Adam. Thank you about grubs. Uh, yeah, milky spore um, is an option, but one of the things out here is it's so like, you've got to be committed to water as far as you know, getting them sort of watered in. And um, we, I think, are too far north for them to sort of persist from year to year. So I know in other parts of the country, milky spore can kind of persist in a lawn and help keep grubs um, you know, at a low, you know, low level or below where you'd be seeing um, damage. But unfortunately, it is dry and cold in South Dakota. So it's tough out there for a bacteria. Um, but I am at 
my sort of insect time. So thank you everybody for the great questions and I'll drop my uh, contact information into the chat as well. Um, but I will turn it back over to John. Thank you, uh, Amanda, and you know that was great. Uh, but a couple things I'm in complete agreement with you with milky spore disease. It was something that we did use out east, but out east we had a combination of moisture and relatively warm winters. And there's been some real good work that shows you start getting out here on the plains and it just really isn't effective. So uh, unfortunately, it is a problem we almost have to live with. But I think our last outbreak was maybe three years ago or four years ago, because as a tree person, what I remember is the grubs when they're adults like to munch on tree leaves. And they're also night feeders. And so I would have people that would say, uh, I don't know what's defoliating my tree. It's uh, the leaves are gone, but I never see anything on it. Well, you got to be out there at about two in the morning. And it doesn't help if you keep your yard light on either, because they are somewhat attracted to, uh, to that as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, it is probably going to be a bad year, uh, a good year for entomologists, but a bad year if you like your lawns or your woody plants. By the way, the other way you know you have white grubs, you meaning your lawn, is uh, this, uh, this year you'll notice the skunks will tear up your entire yard to get them. Uh, and sometimes actually it's the skunks that cause more damage than the uh, white grubs just because you know, you look out there and you go, oh my gosh, what came in at night and literally shredded my entire lawn or large patches. And you'll find you have white grubs or now you have half a white grub uh, here or there. But uh, yeah, skunks are very good at taking them out, but I wouldn't really look at them as very good control. <laughs> you know, we do have a question that might be answered by both of you. Uh, by both of you, I mean, uh, Rhoda and, uh, uh, Amanda here, and that is, when do cane borers become active in raspberries? And I wonder about the, that question. We grew acres of raspberries and cane borer was never one of my problems that I saw here in South Dakota. I know we have it. I've had people send in samples of it, but it's not one I've had to deal with here. So I'm not, off the top of my head, I'm not sure when those become active. Uh, Rhoda or Amanda, do either of you know when they may be flying? I don't Rhoda? know offhand. I was gonna say, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm like, I'm over here doing some really quick Googling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that question we will answer next time because <laughs> uh, that is kind of an important question. We'd like to have an answer for you. Uh, I feel a little embarrassed because it isn't a growlis, uh, which is in the same <laughs> genus of emerald ash borer, one I spent a lot of time working on. And uh, you do get samples of this little D-shaped hole in the cane. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the, the real problem I've dealt with, Rhoda, on uh, raspberries, well, there was really just one, and that's a spotted wing drosophila. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, that was a major problem. And we... We have a minute or two here as a raspberry problem. That's the big one. Could you talk about that for a second? Well, I, I, I think we'll talk about that again more during the summer when we get when we get closer to to fruit bearing. It can actually get in the strawberries too. Mm -hmm. In the past, it's come in later in the summer, but some years recently, it's come in earlier. Um, so I used to say plant summer bearing raspberries and you know avoid it, but I don't think that's the case anymore, unfortunately. Uh, it's one that we're learning more about all the time. Um, the one thing I 
does seem to help is to have a fruit that's exposed to the sun and, and good light because they like to ha hang out in the shade. So the more shaded your raspberry patch is or the more shaded the fruit is, probably the more damage you're going to get. And like I said, we'll bring in some pictures probably in a few weeks. Yeah. The other thing that I recall with them and, and why we have it in Brookings County, I never had it where I was. And I'm very thankful for that because I didn't want to think of even trying to spray for it. Not acres, but the thing that I had, and it sounds funny for the tree guy to say this, I didn't have any trees within a half a mile of me. I mean, there were, there were no woody plants. And I think one of the things we're noticing is that they, they can overwinter in South Dakota. It's not that they just come in. And they do feed on a lot of other brushy plants. Uh, snowberry, we find them in. Buckthorn, we find them in. So sometimes eliminating those other hosts um, can help in reducing the problem as well. I, I've looked at some raspberries uh, where you could actually look at the amount of damage based upon the distance from the windbreak. Now, that might have been shading as well. Uh, the closer rows, but you know, you also had buckthorn, snowberries, uh, cranberry bush. You had a lot of other uh, fruit to feed on and and uh, nectar from flowers. So while you're right, they're not going to be a big problem until later on in the season. The population takes time to build. Sure wouldn't hurt to clean out a an old windbreak uh, if you got a little bit of time and try to remove anything else that is flowering that might produce uh, fruit at another season to help support these. Well, I see, oh, I, it says here, uh, I had cane borer last summer in hot springs. And so we did have an answer from one of our audience and we certainly appreciate that. Um, so with that, if we have any more questions that are out there, if we, I think we answered everyone's question tonight, but we do have the South Dakota State University Extension Garden Hotline, and it's free to everyone um, in South Dakota here. Um, the Aberdeen number, the Rapid City number, and the Sioux Falls numbers are there as well as their website. Uh, people do send pictures of their problems as well. And one of the things that I can mention is that if you send a sample by that, you send a picture there and uh, you know, say, gee, I have something's wrong with my plant, that if they can't answer it, it's gonna get shipped to one of us. And so you might even see that picture on an episode of the Garden Hour, uh, if it's something that really is pertinent to a lot of people. So you know, if you've got pictures of something, you say, well, gee, I'm not quite sure what this is feel free to send it to those emails. There's also phone numbers there you can call. They're, they are staffed there by very competent people, but if they're not sure of the answer, uh, they're gonna contact one of us or perhaps a couple of us to uh, try to get that answer back to you in a timely manner. And like I said, you might see that picture on the garden hour if it's something that really fits a lot of other folks. So as we're winding up here this evening, I do want to at least have one more opportunity for each of our panelists uh, to say goodbye rather than hello. So I'll close it, but we'll take it otherwise in order, Rhoda. And I need to unmute myself. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It was great to have you online and we hope to see you next week. Amanda? Yeah, mute. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. It was great having the questions coming in. This is honestly a really fun way for us to spend an hour um, interacting with you guys. I know since it's on Zoom, we can't see you face to face, but you know, save up your questions, throw them in the in the Q and A for us in the coming weeks, and let your friends know that if they have questions about their yard and garden and trees, to uh, come hang out with us every Tuesday night at seven. And. Christine. Thanks for joining us tonight, everyone. Be on the lookout for Master Gardener educational opportunities in your area. Look for them at the farmer's market and at local plant sales. And I look forward to seeing you again to talk more about flowering perennials and budding plants at a future episode. Thanks and have a great night. <laughs>
right. And thank you again to our panelists here that helped get through our questions and discussion. Hopefully everybody that's attended tonight learned at least one new thing out there. And I would certainly encourage anyone anywhere in the state that it's worth getting in your car and driving to see Macquarie Gardens over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a real showstopper. And Mother's Day may not be a bad day to take mom out to the garden. So uh, I will close as John Ball here. And it's, uh, again, just been a great opportunity to spend the evening with you. Hope you enjoyed Garden Hour and happy gardening. And we'll see you next Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Uh, Central Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Thank you again. Good evening, everyone.